Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. First, I should start by thanking uh, Microsoft for letting me come and talk to you about uh, my area of research, which is approximation algorithms. Um, curiously, for someone who's talking about approximation algorithms, I come from a business school, uh, and I usually teach uh, MBA students. And one thing I learned from teaching MBA students, to whom I usually give two-hour classes, is that the trick is to get the students to start talking. And then you can just sit back and then watch, you know, watch them, you know, do the trick. I'm hoping to use some of that here uh, because I haven't really, you know, prepared uh, very extensive slides. Uh, I thought, what I want to do in the first 10 minutes is to tell you about the plan of my lectures. And then I'm going to, I was planning to use the tablet, but I think I'm going to use the board to do, to execute my plan. Uh, I will ask you all kinds of questions in the middle. Uh, so you will be required to answer some questions on the way. Uh, today and on Thursday, I have some homework problems that I've uh, planted for you to think about and uh, come back uh, with some potential solutions on, uh, in that tutorial time, okay? Uh, but that's, that's the lay of the land. So that's the overview of my first 10 minutes. Uh, basically, I'm going to define what an approximation algorithm is. How many of you know the definition of an approximation algorithm already? Don't be shy, please. OK. All right, OK. How many of you do not know the definition of an approximation algorithm? OK, good. OK. So the others are being very diplomatic. Yeah. Uh, all right, so the toolkit overview will tell you, first I will define what an approximation algorithm is. Maybe I'll pause for a while to see why it is defined that way, what other alternate ways there might be. And uh, then I will talk about some common methods that are used in designing approximation algorithms. And then I will give you the plan of how I, how I intend to cover some of them, okay? So typically, uh, if you, I assume all of you know what an NP-hard problem is. Uh, if you don't, you'll have to go back and read it tonight. Uh, but I'm typically going to be talking about NP-hard optimization problems. So these are not decision problems. These are not yes-no problems. These are problems typically where you want uh, a value as the answer, right? And the class set of problems I'll be drawing from will involve connectivity or disconnectivity in a graph. So I'm going to be heavily working with graph algorithms. And I'm also going to be talking about covering in the sense of, you know, covering clients, demands, so I'm going to be set covering, things like that, okay? So that's basically going to be the two sets of examples that are going to be uh, with me for the five days. And my goal is to tell you about a toolkit of how to design such approximation algorithms for NP-hard problems. But many of you don't know what that is. So an approximation algorithm, the definition is in the bottom there, okay? Is an algorithm which, given a problem, Okay, always gives you an answer. Okay, so it doesn't punt, it always gives you a, an answer, which is, which is feasible. So if you ask to solve a certain kind of problem, it gives you a, a feasible solution to the optimization problem. And uh, suppose your optimization problem is a minimization problem. For example, like the traveling salesman problem that many of you might have heard of. Then the ratio of the approximation algorithm, also called the approximation ratio, or the performance guarantee, okay, is how bad this algorithm solution is in terms of the objective function with respect to the optimal solution. Now, when we say how bad, we could have done it in many different ways. And the particular way that the, this literature tackles it is as a ratio. So it's a ratio of the cost of the solution output by the algorithm. So usually when I say algorithm, I'll be using A or ALG, Right, stuff like that, okay? Or APX for approximation. And whenever I say optimum, I'll be using opt. Okay? So I have an instance of, say, the traveling salesman problem. Opt of I is the solution that's the optimal solution. Cost of opt of I is the cost of that optimal solution. Okay? And I look at that cost and I look at how what is the ratio of the cost of my algorithm and I take the ratio. Okay? And I'm not going to try to do this for every possible instance of the TSP you can give me of the problem. 
and I'm going to consider the worst possible ratio over all the instances to be my performance guarantee. Okay, so let's see how else could I have defined the error ratio of an algorithm if I have cost of opt and cost of difference, right? Yeah. So I could have I could have thought of my guarantee as an additive guarantee, not as a ratio guarantee. So why don't people do that? Why don't we define approximation algorithms to be additive? Because the answer can be very large. So I might get uh, the difference in millions. So I won't be able to actually uh, see whether my this algorithm is better or worse. OK, so you're saying the answer can be very large. Are you talking about a particular class of problems or instances? For driving systems, OK. answer is 50. Good. For Good, I think you have a point here. So if you have a problem, you don't know what the scale of the problem is, right? So like you don't know whether the answers all lie between 0 and 100, between 0 and 1, between 0 and a million. So this additive number between two different algorithms, one for TSP and one for some other facility location problem, they're not in the same scale, right? So that's one problem with an additive guarantee, okay? Another problem which many of you might have encountered when you saw your first introduction to NP hardness is that typically lots of problems when you do the NP hardness reduction, right, they also allow you to modify the instance reduction a little bit so that getting additive guarantees is also NP hard. This is not, I'm not, this is not a universal statement, okay, but I'm just saying typically it's not, it's very fragile. This additive, additive, re, uh, additive performance is a very fragile thing. Okay, so if I'm, you know, what would you do when you want to design a, you know, uh, a NP hardness reduction? You start with something like SAT, and you design an optimization problem, and what would you say the solution is? You'll say the solution has value at most something if the SAT formula is satisfiable. Right, that would be what the reduction looks like. Typically, at most something has a little bit of wiggle room in it, depending on the parameters you put in the reduction. So you know, getting within that additive error also turns out to be NP hard. Right? So now if I have additive ratio, additive performance guarantee, it doesn't quite work out. But now there is a flip side to having a ratio. Can anybody identify what's the problem? What is, when are ratios problematic? When one of the numbers is zero, right? So if the, ratio, if the denominator in the problem is zero, we don't have an approximation algorithm for the problem. And this comes up again and again. Whenever people try to design an approximation algorithm for a problem, sometimes the interesting case of the optimization problem is when the optimal solution is value zero. But then I can't design an approximation algorithm. So this is what we call the zero problem in approximation algorithms. Okay? So there are choices people make when they try to design a definition like this. And we saw a beautiful example this morning of how the decision really uh, drives you know, what, you, what progress you can make. You'll see that in the next five days. So here, these are the design choices. It's either an additive or an approx or a ratio. Does anybody know of other examples of approximation guarantees? How good an algorithm is? No? Yeah. Max with the average, excellent. Okay, so you can do, yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do even with the ratio. Uh, that would be kind of difficult because you'll have to do an average over all instances of a certain size n, right? So that, you know, all graphs of a certain size n, you know, that would be kind of a difficult one. Yeah, that's a legitimate definition. Average case approximation ratio. Um, so you could replace that with, you know, instances coming from a distribution, and I guess you get average case analysis, something akin to that, right? Um, there are also other examples, like for example, you can rank all the solutions to a problem. In a traveling salesman problem, every solution is a cycle through all the nodes. So the number of cycles is like n factorial of that order. You can rank all of them in terms of the cost. Okay? And you can say the ratio or the goodness of your algorithm is, you, you say an algorithm is 20% good if for every instance you'll always get a solution in the top 20 percentile of that ranking. Okay, this is called Z approximations. And there is a set of people who actually design Z approximations for these problems. Okay, uh, there are other ways to tackle NP hard problems too, which I won't talk at all about. One is uh, typically to look at 
tractable cases. Identify special cases where it's not NP hard, right? So like, you know, the graph is tree width bounded by something, if it looks like a planar graph, something like that, right? The other is actually the one that's most prevalent, uh, which is just to design some kind of a heuristic using a set of like meta ideas, like local improvement, local search, right? Search in a small neighborhood of solutions, or do some kind of taboo search, simulated annealing, right? So that's basically what mostly happens when people are uh, faced with these approximation uh, type problems. And uh, then there is also, uh, yeah, so I guess that, that sort of covers it. I don't want to say any more about this slide, but that's basically what we are looking at. That's the context we are at. Now, when I'll be talking of ratios, the ratios will span a, a large spectrum. Uh, how many of you know what a PTAS is? PTAS, okay, so tell us what a PTAS is. Good. So given any epsilon, which is something the user specifies, okay, I can come with within ratio 1 plus epsilon. So for example, if epsilon is 0.1, my ratio is uh, 1.1, right? 1 plus epsilon is 1.1. So that's like 10% error. Okay? And uh, you, if you want, you can make it 5% error by specifying epsilon to be 0 0.05, right? And a PTAS is not one algorithm, like you said. It's a one algorithm for every epsilon. But as you make the error smaller and smaller, the algorithm will run longer and longer. So the running time of a polynomial time approximation scheme is polynomial in the size of the problem and one over epsilon. So you know it scales with epsilon. So it's, a PTAS is a beautiful class of approximation algorithms because in some sense you specify, the user specifies the error they want to run for and out comes an algorithm with a limited running time. Typically, most of the algorithms I'll be talking about have constant factor approximation ratios. Constant just means a fixed number. You can't change the dial, okay? So the dials will be, you know, the numbers will be like 2, 2.1, 3, 6, 10, 20, 40, whatever, right? Or, sadly, for many problems, the best approximation algorithms we know how to design actually grow with the size of the problem. So as I give you a larger problem, your error is growing with the size of the problem. So some of the growing functions are things like number of times you have to take logs to get to a constant. That's log star n. Or poly logs in n. Or even worse, something like n to the power of one-third, n to the power of one-fourth. Right? It's kind of crazy, right? I have a huge, uh, a large problem, and the ratio is like n to the power of one-fourth, okay? So when you start thinking like, you know, what is this? You know, why is this guy talking about algorithms where the error ratio is growing so hard? Uh, luckily, in the last 20 years or so, there is a parallel line of work which has tried to argue that some of these numbers that you see in this chart like, uh, you know, a constant factor, like, you know, uh, 1.7, 1.483, right? Or a growing function like log star n, log squared n, they cannot be beat. So what does that mean? There are people who are able to show for certain classes of problems. If you can solve the problem with an approximation ratio better than log star n, it's as good as getting the correct optimal answer. So, Going below a certain approximation threshold is as is NP hard, is what these people are proving. Okay, so now uh, I don't feel so bad about talking about these approximation algorithms anymore because, you know, in some sense we have designed the best possible approximations we can for these problems. Okay, and what I'm talking about when I talk about this lower bounds for approximation ratios is the development from the PCP theorem. And more recently, you know, this, uh, the extensions of these multi-prover games. Uh, that, again, is not something I'm going to tell you about. But there is, you know, there are some very nice surveys, which I'll, I'll put in the end, okay, which has this uh, development. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. That's the range of numbers. Essentially, if there's one thing you should remember after many years from now about this workshop, from my talk, okay, is just these two points. Okay, uh, the task of designing an approximation algorithm just comes down to one thing. How to bound it. How to bound an optimal solution. Okay? 
And as far as I can tell, there's really only two answers at the very highest level, right? You just look very carefully at an optimal solution, right? And you come up with a bound related to uh, something that the optimal solution is doing to be feasible. Or a lower bound, sorry. Yeah, it could be an upper bound too. It depends on whether it's a minimization or a maximization problem, right? The other one is you com compare yourself with a relaxation. By relaxation, I mean you don't even go all the way of what the optimal solution is required to do. You just go sort of uh, do something, part of what the optimal solution is trying to do. That's what I mean by relaxation. Like relax some of the requirements, okay? Now, there are two ways you can come, there are many ways you can come up with relaxation. I'll be telling you about relaxations coming from mathematical programming, particularly linear programming. Okay, so here is a little bit more about how you might use that first bullet. How can you use an optimal solution to bound what you're trying to do? Okay, so the standard way and the one I'll start with today is look at an optimal solution, a feasible solution, and look at which part of it can you find efficiently in polynomial time. That's the first idea for today. It turns out, or you might look for a maximal structure that does what you want to do in polynomial time. Okay? So these are actually very commonly used ideas. The third bullet is about discovering an improvement to a solution that you currently have based on optimum. So you have a feasible solution, you think it's not good enough, then you ask yourself, why is it not good enough? Suppose there was a better solution which was like 10 times better I should be able to make a little change in my current solution and make it slightly better. Okay? So that's one way you can use an optimal solution to improve where you are. Okay? Another way is you look at an optimal solution and you say, it looks too complicated. Let me just uh, refine the set of solutions I'm looking to be from a smaller class that I can enumerate over. But now you have to worry about how much worse the optimum has gotten by restricting yourself to the smaller class. Okay? So that's one way you can use an optimal solution. You can try to convert it into one that looks nice. It's coming from a smaller class. Okay? Or you know, just look for places where near optimal solutions are easy to find. So all of these have names, by the way. If you see a typical text in approximation algorithms, the first two where you look for a maximal structure is typically a greedy algorithm, some kind of an augmenting algorithm. If you look for uh, how a good solution can help you get from a current bad solution to a slightly better one, that's involved in local search, you know, in analysis of local search algorithms. Okay? If you try to convert your, your solution to something that is nice and enumerate over the nice solutions, that's what is usually done using dynamic programming. Okay? And the last one I don't think I'll have time to cover this is where you take your algorithm, your, your input, and you try to decompose the cost function into parts that are easy to manage. It's called the local ratio technique. It's a little bit on the fringe, I won't get there, okay? But this is how you might compare, this is the first way of bounding an optimal solution, okay? Is to compare it with something you can do with the optimal solution. I'll give you examples of these in the first two lectures. The second one, the second way, is to compare not with uh, optimum, but with the relaxation. And usually by relaxation, I will think of linear programming. Okay? How many of you do not know what linear programming is? It's okay, don't be shy. Okay, I'm going to ask the others a difficult question about linear programming right after this, so. All right. Okay, so do you know what complementary slackness is? Do you? No, okay, so you don't know linear programming. Okay. How many of you know linear programming? Okay, all right. Okay, so that's more like a good sample. Because I'm going to use four properties, four important properties of linear programs to try to design approximation algorithms. So for example, I will need all of you to know that every linear program has a basic feasible solution or a vertex solution or an extreme point solution. I'll, know, I'll need for all of you to know what the dual of a linear program is. Okay? I'll need for all of you to know what the complementary slackness conditions are. Sorry for singling you out, but uh, I'll tell you what that is. Okay? Uh, and I'll also need for you to know, as a general knowledge, not in intimate detail, how you can write a linear program with an exponential number of constraints and still solve it in polynomial time. So this is an idea called separation. 
uh, and it involves an ellipsoid method. But I need you to know these four things, okay? Because they are the, they are the toolkits for comparing with relaxation. So what, what I want to do is, once I write my problem as a linear program, and I'm able to solve it, then I can use the solved problem, the solved linear programming problem, to design my approximation algorithm. And then there are many ways I can go about using it. For example, I can just look at the values, and any value that's very close to one, I can set it to one, just round it. Or I can use the values of my linear program as probabilities and build a probability distribution and run a randomized algorithm right, with those coin tosses. Or I can just look at the part of the linear programming solution which gave me the correct answer, take it as a correct answer, reduce the problem, the part that I've solved, and then continue like that. Okay? So I can slowly proceed in this way using a linear program. Or I can use the values that the LP provides as distances in some graph, in some metric. And given that I now know what distances look like in a graph, I can use properties of metrics to round them. Okay, these are all many different ways I can use a linear program. Okay, and I'm going to tell you about all of them. Okay, so they go under the name deterministic rounding. In the second one, I actually don't even solve the linear program. I construct a pair of primal and dual solutions and I try to keep them close. Or I can do randomized rounding, iterative rounding, or I can do metric rounding. Okay? So these are the two important slides you should remember. Okay? When people design approximation algorithms, the main question they're asking is how to bound it. And the two answers are either look at an optimal solution and try to pick some piece that you can use to design an algorithm. And that goes via greedy, local search, dynamic programming, okay? or some sort of structural methods. Or you look at a relaxation like a linear program, or you can be more fancy and use semi-definite programs, or any sort of solvable convex programs, okay? And you can use, you do any of these tricks with them, okay? Deterministic rounding, primal dual, randomized rounding, iterated rounding, or structural rounding, metric rounding. So that gives me my lecture plan, okay? Today I'm going to tell you about very simple greedy and local search algorithms. Tomorrow I'll tell you about dynamic programming and I'll also introduce LPs, okay? Then I'll do simple rounding and primal dual algorithms. Then I'll move on to iterated rounding and finally metric rounding, okay? Thinking of LP values as metrics. Here's some more detail, okay? Uh, the guiding word here is tentative uh, because, you know, it depends on how fast I, I get through this stuff. And uh, the values, the, the problems in red are the examples that I'm going to use to illustrate these techniques, okay? Don't worry so much about this now, uh, but the one thing you might want to do is to, if you, actually, one thing you have to do, uh, you're, you're spending five days of your life listening to these lectures, okay? So it behooves upon you to go and read something related to this. Uh, the one that's mostly, most easily accessible is using that internet access, you can get a downloadable PDF copy of the book by David and David Schmoys and Williamson from their website. And that has roughly the same tag time following in the book. The book is divided into two parts. First part bounds it using opt. Second part bounds it using a relaxation. Okay, so that's a good place to start to try to, you know, see some details of these exercises. The very first book on approximations was an edited survey by Dorit Hogbaum. Uh, it's over 15 years old now. There's also a book which is very problem-centric by Vijay Vazirani. It's a Springer book. That's also a great book to read because all the chapters are short and concise. and It's got really clean analysis. And if you just search for lecture notes, there are a variety of researchers in this area who have written excellent lecture notes. So everything I'm doing in the next five lectures, most of it is not my own. It's all from these lecture notes. Okay? So that's actually uh, a great... Uh, Benefit now, there's a large community of people working in this area who are trying to also find better and better analysis for existing algorithms. So what I'm going to talk about is going to use these simplified analysis of sometimes uh, complicated problems, okay? So that's the question. Any comments uh, at this point before I launch on to greedy algorithms? If not, you should write down that very long key right now because I'm going to erase it in a second, yeah. Okay, 
So the first problem I have is TSP. So let me tell you what the TSP is while you write this down. Okay. Um, TSP is a generalization of the Hamiltonian cycle problem in a graph. Okay. So you're given an undirected graph. Okay. And the Hamilton cycle problem looks for a simple cycle in the graph okay, that visits every node exactly once. Okay. It's NP hard to determine if the graph has a Hamilton cycle. Okay. So now we can take that Hamilton cycle problem and convert it into an optimization problem. This is, this is a decision problem, right? Yes or no. Okay. And the natural way to do it is put value 1 on all the edges in the graph right? and put a higher value than 1 than on all the non-edges in the graph. Okay. So now I ask, find me a cycle which goes through all the nodes in the graph of minimum total length. Okay. Now what is the answer if the graph is Hamiltonian? It's the size of V, which I'll always call N. Okay. So if the graph is Hamiltonian, the answer will be N. Otherwise, it will be something bigger than N. Because you won't find a cycle with all one edges. Okay. So that's simple, right? So this also tells us that if I have an approximation algorithm for this problem, the, the TSP problem is that problem. Given a graph with lengths on the edges, find a Hamilton cycle of minimum total length. That's what the TSP is. Okay, it's called traveling salesperson problem. Okay, usual story, right? You know, the guy has to travel on a graph and sell stuff in every city, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so suppose I have a, a row approximation for this problem. Okay, so what does that mean? That means I have an algorithm, right, which the cost of on any instance. Okay, remember this is my definition of approximation ratio. Right? This is bounded by the other direction. Right? Some number rho. Rho is typically going to be bigger than one, right? Because I'm minimizing the length of this uh, thing. Okay, all right. So this is what this is. Okay, now think of a Hamiltonian graph. What is the denominator going to be? N, right? So it's going to be N for a Hamiltonian graph. Okay? So you're going to give me something bigger than N, and it's always going to be at most rho times N. Okay? Now, here's a question. For this, Hamilton, for this TSP problem, right, where on the edges of the graph, okay, the cost is 1. Okay, and if the, it's not an edge, then I give uh, value something. Let's say some large number L. Okay, so if the graph is not Hamiltonian, what will the what will the numerator look like? What what will it be its value? Yeah, it will be n plus L minus one. Let's say, right? Because you have to at least have one edge of value L, right? So now, here's the game. If I gave you a row approximation, okay, I can always make L large enough so that this never happens, right? For any row. So for example, in particular, if I make L be row times M, L is just some large number. You gave me a graph of size M, okay? I'll make L be row times N plus two, let's say. Right? Then you, this, this inequality will never hold. So what we have discovered is that, just by looking at this problem, it does not have any approximation algorithm for any finite row. Yeah? Just from the definition, I've realized that it's as hard as computing a Hamiltonian path, a cycle. Because if I had a row, so the formal argument will be set L to be rho n plus 1, right? Or something of that magnitude, right? Large enough. If there is a row approximation algorithm, then the solution you will get, right, has to, has to not use any L edge, any large edge, 
That means all the edges it uses are original edges, which means you've got a Hamilton cycle. I've detected a Hamilton cycle. Okay? So, TSP in and of itself does not have an approximation algorithm with any finite factor rho. So we have to put some conditions on how large L can be. Okay? And a natural condition is the one that comes from geography, right? Is that the costs on the edges obey triangle inequality. It just says that, you know, to go from city I to K, right? So these are the costs on the edges, right? So the C I K should not be larger than going through any other city. So, you know, C I K should be less than or equal to, right? C I J plus C J K. Right? For all j. Okay, i, j, k are distinct. Yeah? Um, good question. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's a nitpick. I don't want to get too far there, but, you know, it really does not work. Yeah. It really does not work because, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't need this to be one, right? And I don't need to have made L to be rho times n. It could be some other large constant times n. So, so it really does not work. Okay. Uh, if you allow me to have costs which are bigger than 2 to the 2 to the n, yes. So, so yeah. Yeah, so basically there is no... You know, if you're going to bound the size of L by some representation number, right, you can't even get close to that. So basically, it's impossible to do anything to recognize whether you've got a single edge. Okay. Uh, you're asking a legitimate question because I raised the thing about rho being a function of n, I think. But uh, in this case, it's just completely hopeless. Right? Because I can multiply whatever number you want to get by some other large number of that magnitude, and I cannot get anything close to it. So it's, real, it's just totally impossible. Okay, so let me get to triangle inequality, right? If the costs obey triangle inequality, then I say that the instance is metric. Okay, and now this does not hold because, you know, this, this L thing does not hold because if I have two edges, right? If there's a path of length two, right? This guy can be at most two in a metric instance. Okay, in general, in a metric instance between any two guys, the distance is at most n minus 1. So, you know, it can never get very large. Okay? For the metric TSP, there is a good approximation algorithm. Good in the sense of it's, it, it has a bounded guarantee. Okay? So, I'll show you what the metric TSP approximation algorithm is. Okay? So, let's recall what is our whole point of doing this is we want to figure out, you want to pick, you want to use opt, right, to get you part of the way there. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do with this example. Okay, so let's try to do that. Okay, I think we don't need any of this. Yeah. Okay, so I need to use opt. In this case, remember, so I have a metric problem. And here is what opt looks like. Actually, as just a side remark, if the metric itself is the Euclidean distances on the plane, right, the TSP tour will not cross. You see that? It crosses, then you can just replace it with these two and get shorter distance. Okay, this is just a side remark, you know, it's just a fun fact, but it's not important for us. Okay, so we have a metric TSP. This is what opt looks like. What I'm trying to do is to uh, find a way for the traveling salesman to go, right? I'm trying to find a solution which I can bound by some constant times the optimal, okay? And here is an optimal solution, okay? What part of it can I discover in polynomial time? Okay, so here is where actually it really pays to know your polynomial time algorithms well. So in other words, you really need to know what is the limits of what you can do 
with these structures in polynomial time. Okay? So you really need to know good graph, graph algorithms. Okay? Perhaps the hardest set of polynomial solvable graph problems are, what class of problems do you think are the most sophisticated algorithms for in graphs? Matchings, right? So we probably need to use some kind of matchings here. Okay? Uh, what are easy problems on a graph that you probably saw in your first graph algorithms course? Depth for such trees, right? Yeah, good, excellent. Okay, all right. So we've got a cycle. If I delete an edge, I get a path, and a path is also a spanning tree. Okay, so definitely opt contains a spanning tree. Okay, so let's find a spanning tree in the graph. So our first try for an algorithm is compute MST. Minimum spanning tree using your favorite Kruskal's or Prim's or whatever you like. Okay. So that will give me some tree in this graph. Okay. Right. But this is nothing like a tour, right? I need to take a I need to take the traveling salesperson from one place to the other. Okay? And here comes, so basically designing an approximation algorithm has two parts. One part, you try to figure out what can you build from opt. Okay? On the other side, you try to make, you know, you try to take uh, the feasibility condition. In this case, the feasibility condition is to make this tour. Okay? And you try to get it closer and closer to what you've already gotten already. Okay, so my first step, I came from that side, I got myself a tree. Okay, now I'm trying to see, how do I make this tree a feasible tour? Okay, this is the other analysis I have to go through. Okay, first of all, notice that the cost of opt, right, is definitely greater than or equal to the cost of the MST. Is that clear? Right, because, you know, I deleted an edge, I got a spanning tree. This spanning tree is greater than or equal to in cost than the minimum spanning tree. Okay, so this part is good. Okay, I only spent one times optimum so far. But I need to fix it to be a tour. Okay, what is a tour in a graph which obeys a triangle inequality? And now we can again go back to our graph theory. Okay, and say, look, if the cost obey triangle inequality, I don't really need to give you a Hamilton cycle. I can give you something that allows me to take a Hamilton tour. But I don't actually have to give you a one Hamilton cycle. So what can I give you? I need to visit all the nodes, right? That's what the tour is about, OK? I just need to be able to visit all of them, OK? So I just need to find a cycle that visits all the nodes. And it comes back to where it started, because it's a, it's a complete cycle. So what kind of cycle is that? Okay, so you have to really think, you know, this is, uh, so actually it turns out in a, in a graph with triangle inequality, the TSP problem is exactly the same as finding a way to visit all the nodes and come back to where you started. I actually don't care if you visit a node more than once. Why? This is where triangle inequality helps me. Because when I come to a node, for the first time, so let's, I start here. So this is the first guy, second, third, fourth, fifth. I continue, sixth, seventh, eighth. I'm coming back to five. But then I'm continuing to this node, right? Now, instead of coming from eight to five and then going to this node, if I directly went here, triangle inequality tells me the cost of this direct edge is less than or equal to the cost of going through five. Okay, so that means I can delete this part, delete this part, and go directly here and call this guy number nine. Okay, and then I can continue in my walk. This guy will be 10, this guy will be 11. Again, I don't want to visit nine. So I can delete this guy, delete this guy, go directly to this guy, call it 12, and I'm done. Okay, so all I need to do in a graph of triangle inequality is just find a walk that just touches every vertex and gets back to where it started. Okay, and if you know your graph theory, this is called an Euler tool, right? Good. So I just need to find a connected, why connected? Because it has to touch all the nodes, Eulerian subgraph. Great. Now I've come from the other side, okay? From one side, I got myself a tree. 
Now I started with all, with my problem and I converted into a simpler problem. I don't have to look for a Hamilton cycle. It suffices to look for a connected Eulerian subgraph. Excellent. Okay. Problems got an easier. Okay. How do I get an Eulerian? What is the con condition for Eulerianness of a graph? When is a graph Eulerian? Every node has even degree. Okay. How can I make a spanning tree have every node even degree? Sorry, so just connect the leaves, yeah, okay, but then what about a node of degree 3? Duplicate. Duplicate the tree. So just double the tree. Right? Everybody's degree becomes 2 times something, it's even. It's great. I'm finished. Okay, what's my approximation ratio? 2. Because I've used 2 times the spanning tree. Okay, so this is usually called the Euler shortcutting heuristic. Okay, doubled spanning tree heuristic. Okay, so the doubled MST heuristic gives a two approximation algorithm for metric TSP. Okay, how did we discover it? We start with the graph, opt, see what we can find is a tree. Then we started on the other side, we made it simpler, and then we just connected the two by doubling. Okay. All right, I think everybody got it, so I can continue. Okay, so can I do better than two? So compute MST, double it. And then you got yourself a connected Eulerian subgraph. Okay, so the approximation ratio will be two. Can I do better than two? Of course we can. Okay, sorry? Sorry, say that. Okay, okay. Right. Good. Okay, so what should I do? Don't repeat the travel. Don't repeat the travel. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me try to understand your idea. So if I try to find a TSP in this graph, double tree, let's say I start here, one. I go here, two, three, four. I won't go back to three. Is that what you say? Yeah, so I won't go back to three, that's right. In fact, I'm going to erase those two and then go directly there to five. Right? Then I won't come back to three again because it's already visited. But the point is, the cost of this edge four to five, right? I can only bound it by the cost of four to three plus three to five by triangle inequality. But I can't tell you that I always save something by doing that. I might, but I can't guarantee that you'll save something. Do you see the point? So because of that, even though I, I, I follow your idea, I cannot guarantee any savings. Okay, so this trick, while it will give you a Hamilton cycle, it won't allow you to prove the cost to be anything strictly better than two times optimum. Maybe you were lucky, you got the wrong tree, and each one of the shortcuts cost exactly equal to this plus this. What can you do? You have used two times the tree. So I'm looking for a better idea. Many of you know it. Uh, but remember, all I want is even degree subgraph. Okay? So, yeah, you know that. Okay. So, that's the, that's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. I didn't plant it. Okay? So, in this graph, in this tree again, right, there is... Um, there are some nodes where things look okay. Like this guy is okay. He's already got even degree. Right? This guy is also okay. This guy is also okay. Everybody else has the wrong degree. They all have odd degree. Right? But I want even degree everywhere. So all I have to do is to add edges to this tree such that everybody's degree increases by one. That's exactly a matching. So, okay, so the solution says add minimum cost perfect matching on odd of t. Odd of t is a set of nodes with odd degree in the tree. Okay, well, of course, for me to come to this step, I need to know that 
minimum cost perfect matchings are solvable in polynomial time, even with weights on the edges. Okay, so that's the general knowledge you need to have to be able to get to this point. Okay, but first of all, if I want a perfect matching, I have to make sure that the number of nodes is even. Is that true? Yeah, because number of odd degree nodes in any graph is even. Okay, fine, good. Okay, so I can find a minimum cost perfect matching using one of several algorithms, right? How do I relate this to opt? That's the question remaining to finish our analysis. Okay, so let's see what the odd degree nodes are. Okay, so there's a bunch of them. These x nodes are the odd degree nodes. Okay, I need to form a perfect matching between them. Okay, and I have to relate the cost of that to the cost of opt. Again, now we go back to the other side. Okay, we say from opt, can I extract a matching on the odd degree nodes so that that matching will be a feasible solution to this perfect matching problem? Okay, so this is the question. Okay, I have a set of odd degree nodes in my tree, which is a tree that you picked using the MST algorithm. I need to somehow relate the cost of the perfect matching on them. So now I go back to my first step. Remember, there are two sides I'm trying to work from. This side, I ask myself, okay, there is an even number of nodes here. I don't know who they are. Six nodes like that. Okay? I need to find a matching between these nodes. Okay? Nice thing is a tour gives you two matchings. Right? In the tour, I can either go from... 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, along the tour, that will be one path, set of paths. Or I can take the other paths, which is go from 2 to 3, 4 to 5, 6 to 1. Right? Now look at the path from 1 to 6, for example. This path on the optimum solution, right, gives actually a way to match 1 to 6, of course, no more than the path in the optimal solution. Why? Right? Triangle inequality. Similarly, the path from 2 to 3 in optimum, right, gives me a way of bounding the cost of this direct edge 2 to 3. Similarly, 4 to 5. Okay, so I have found myself one dotted matching, and I can find the other matching, right, just by shifting, right, and both of these matchings together make up optimum. So the, the outcome is I can take opt and decompose it into two perfect matchings on the odd degree nodes. Therefore, one of those matchings will be cost at most half of opt. Therefore, the cheapest matching I find will be cost at most half of opt. When I add that cheapest matching, everybody's degree will be even. It was already connected to begin with. I get a three half approximation. Okay, this is how I went from double spanning tree to add min cost perfect matching on order of t. Okay, let's call this m. Okay, t union m is now a connected Eulerian subgraph. So I'm finished. Cost of t is one times cost of opt, and cost of m, right, is at most half cost of opt. Okay, and how did I get that? By this decomposition argument. Okay, this is very important. This is what I'm going to do for the next. Uh, 40 minutes, okay? I always want to take a solution, decompose it into parts, and then I want to see if I can find a polynomial time algorithm to find one of those parts. Then I'll take that part, throw it into my solution, and I'll continue, okay? Until I'm done, okay? So this gave me three half, right? So I'm, I'm done with TSP, I'm going to continue. Okay, all right, no questions, I assume. Okay, good, metric TSP is done. Progress. I think before I do, I had one thing which I'm going to skip over, which is uh, k-vertex connected spanning subgraph, because I'm going much slower than planned. But let me do the other important one for greedy. The problem is set cover. Set cover problem is very important, it's very simple to state. I have a bunch of elements in a ground set U. 
Okay, call the elements E1, E2 until Em. So size of U is M. Okay, and I have a bunch of sets, S1 through Sn. Okay, and set Si has cost Ci, let's say. Okay, and these are subsets of these elements. I'll, rep I'll represent them by a simple bipartite graph, the incidence graph. So, you know, if set 1 contains 1, 2, and m, I'll draw an edge from set S1. Okay, so I get a bipartite in, you know, containment graph. Okay, set cover problem is to find a minimum cost collection of these guys whose union is all of you. Why is it called covering? Because I want to cover everybody in you, right? And I want to do it at minimum cost. Okay? Okay, here I'm going to come up with the next idea for greedy. Uh, that one is the second bullet. Arbitrary, non-negative. Whenever I talk of cost in this set of lectures, it'll be non-negative. Okay, I don't want to deal with uh, you know getting something and so on. Yeah, the arbitrary cost function. Yeah. So what is an algorithm for this? where you try to be greedy. So actually, I'm telling you algorithms now in a way that, you know, the, if, you, if I just ask you, find a greedy algorithm for set covering, you'll probably come up with the one I'm going to talk about, right? But the way I want to motivate it is, right, think of how you can use opt to get something that will help you finish off your job. Okay, so to begin with, you've got no sets with you. Okay, and you need your, your job is to finish covering all these guys. Okay, so what you need to do is to use opt to somehow figure out a way to pick one, two, many sets such that it can, they can help you finish this job of covering off. Okay, and what's the best sort of, the fastest way to get there? Maximum cardinality, great. But we have costs. So what you're saying would be great if all the costs were one. I completely agree with you. Because that will get you fastest to finishing up. Okay? So if you have costs, take the ratio. So this is the ratio greedy algorithm. Okay? Pick. Okay, so to begin with, all the guys are uncovered. So I'll just define by ui number of uncovered at beginning of iteration i. Okay, so to begin with u1 is just everybody. Nothing has happened. You haven't made any progress. Okay, how do you pick the set si? Pick si to be the guy who minimizes uh, the cost. Okay, I don't need all this j and all. Just call it cost divided by how much newly it covers, right? What is it covering newly? It's S, okay, intersect UI. Right? UI is the guys you haven't finished off yet. So whoever is covering the most uncovered elements at the best ratio, you take it. Okay? And you just repeat, that's all. Until you finish the job. It's like a knapsack. Yeah, it's, it's like the greedy algorithm form. But it's just basic, the idea is ratio greedy, that's all. Okay, you can be greedy in many ways, I'm just trying to be ratio greedy. Okay, this is a basic algorithm and the analysis I'm going to show you now is tight. Okay, even though the analysis will give me a number which won't be two, it will be a growing function of M. Okay, so you might say, ah, that looks really bad. If I get to a larger set cover problem, I'm using more sets. But the fact is you can't do much better than that. Okay, but it's still a very basic building block I want to show you. Okay, so what I'm now going to show you using the same look for look at opt and try to get two matchings, remember what we got? I'm going to use the same idea to come up with an analysis of this greedy algorithm. Okay? All right. So there is, every time you do a ratio greedy algorithm, there is one very important step. Okay? Which is, when you are doing step i, 
right? The fact that there is an optimal solution that covers everybody gives you an inequality, gives you a relationship between the cost of your set and the cost of the optimal solution. Okay, that's what I need to write down. Okay, let's write that down. So what does this imply? What's the implication of the ratio greedy step? Okay, you are at some step i in the algorithm. Okay, you've already picked some sets. Okay, those guys have already covered some nodes. Right, these guys are already done. Okay, and these are the guys that are remaining. And these are the members of you that are not yet covered. Okay, this is what we've been calling UI. Okay, now you know there exists an optimal solution which covers everybody. Okay, so take that optimal solution. Okay, we don't know what that is. This is the same argument as TSP, right? I'm taking the optimal solution. So maybe the optimal solution is, is these four guys. Okay, you know they cover everybody. Maybe Opt even had this guy. Okay, so they cover, you know, these guys, they cover whoever is remaining. Okay, so now I want to ask myself, I am picking the set which covers at the best ratio, right? Opt, with all of its cost, is able to cover everybody. What is the relationship of my ratio to Opt's ratio? Okay, what is opt's ratio? Well, cost of all of opt divided by everything else that's remaining. Right, what is my ratio at time step C of SI over size of SI intersect U? Right, can I relate these two? Yeah, greater than, less than or equal to. Why is that? Averaging, right? Just averaging, right? Because look, let's say opt has set C1, C2, and C3, right? C1 covers some guys, you know, C2 covers some guys, C3 covers some guys. The union of their coverage is at least UI, right? So each of the, what is this number? This number is like opt number is C of, uh, S1, C of S2, C of S3, let's say, space. Okay, and it covers some sets, you know, S1, S2, S3. Right? But the fact is, the sum of these guys is at least everybody, right? Because opt finishes everything off. So the sum of these guys is at least that. The sum of those guys is exactly that. Therefore, I'll get this inequality. Okay, so all I'm using is, it's just this lemma that if I have, you know, C divided by N, C1 divided by N1, C2 divided by N2, C3 divided by N3, right? If I sum them numerator-wise and denominator-wise, right? that value will be greater than or equal to the minimum. Right? And what I've got is the minimum. Okay? So this is not a very difficult step. Finished. Okay? So now, once I have this, I'm basically done because the rest is just algebra. But the important point is, whenever you run a greedy algorithm, right, this is what you have to prove. Okay? So the problem I'm going to ask you to think about for today requires you to figure out what should you choose to be the ratio step so that you can prove this relationship? Because once you prove this relationship, then the rest is just algebra to finish up a log n approximation guarantee. And I'll show you that algebra now. It is, if you've not seen it, you should, it's important, so you should know what it is. Okay, so let's just do that. The algorithm, the analysis is very straightforward. You start with U1, which is M. Everybody that's not covered, okay? What is the i plus first, I just say size of ui is small ui, okay? So what is the size of the remaining guys you need to cover at i plus one? Well, you already had i guys to cover, okay? And you just covered what si covered, right? But what si covered is at least, I'm just going to, 
size SI intersect UI, just algebra going up is at least UI multiplied by cost of SI over cost of opt. Right? It's just going the other way. So I can substitute for this thing here. So I'm taking away at least something. So what's left is at most something. Right? It's UI. This also has a UI there, so I can factor it out. 1 minus C of SI over C of opt. OK? Now you can be a little more fancy and use this simplification. The expansion, the Taylor expansion for E of X. I just use the first term. Right? The next term is positive, so it's less than or equal to. Cool. OK, now I have a recurrence. Let's say the very last set you chose was the teeth set. Okay? So ut is at most u1 times the product right, of these numbers. Okay? T is the last guy you chose. Okay? The, you know, the step before you just finished it off. Okay? Now take logs. It was the only natural thing to do, okay? So you take ln ut by u1 less than or equal to, the sum, this will become a sum, okay? t minus 1, I guess, right? Minus c of si over c of opt, okay? Now multiply this inequality by minus 1. Why? Because ut is much smaller than u1. u1 is very large, right? It's what you started with. So if I do that, then I can just, since I'm replacing, multiplying by minus 1, the inequality reverses, the minus sign goes away. OK? And I've got myself a bound of the cost of all the sets I chose. The sum of all the cost of SIs is less than or equal to the cost of the optimal solution times the ln of u1 over ut. OK, u1 is m. Ut is some number, at least one. So this is ln m. You with me? OK, so this finally means summation c of si is less than or equal to c of opt times ln of u1 over ut. i equals 1 to t minus 1. OK, look at the beauty of this analysis. I can do this analysis. I can stop it at any point t. Okay, so this means, suppose I, I don't want a full set cover. I only want a set cover which covers half of the elements. Then ut can be only u1 over 2. Then by paying ln of 2 times opt, I can cover half the set of elements. Okay, so this also gives you something for covering at some rate. Okay, so this is quite useful. Okay, so the only thing that's left to finish the approximation guarantee is you not paid for the very last set the teeth set. But that's easy because if you plug the teeth set in this inequality, c of st divided by whatever is left is less than or equal to c of op divided by whatever is left. Whatever is left is exactly equal. This just says the last set is at most opt. Therefore, how much am I paying? Ln of m plus 1 times opt. Okay, So that tells me, so if I add to this cost of st, that itself is less than or equal to opt. Together, both of these will tell me that I have a ln m plus 1 approximation. OK, so like I said, this is algebra. It's useful algebra. It's good for you to know and remember. But it gives you a lot of interesting insights. Whenever you use optimal solution, to get a piece which is covering something at the fastest rate you can, then by proving this ratio lemma, okay, if you're able to prove this ratio lemma at the rate at which you are covering with respect to the rate of opt, then you get for free a log of m algorithm, where m is the parameter that you are covering. Right? In this case, it's just sets. It also gives you some outcomes, which is you can cover partially at a cheaper rate by setting u1 and ut differently. And you can also solve problems like maximum coverage. 
Suppose I only give you K sets, and I ask you, you know, all the sets cost one, I give you K sets, I say, go and cover the maximum elements you can. Run the same analysis, and you will realize that you will cover one minus one over E of everything. Why? Because the C opt will be K, C S will be K, and you know, you just do the analysis, you'll get E to the minus one. So what will be left will be one over E, what will be covered will be one minus one over E. So this also gives you the max coverage version of this problem. Okay? But what I want you to remember from all of this is using opt, if you prove a ratio greedy lemma by getting the right decomposition, then you get a log m times approximation. Also, another side point, if I can't prove a perfect ratio greedy lemma, but I can prove this with a multiplicative factor of alpha here, then that alpha just multiplies C opt, and it comes out all the way here. So instead of a ln m approximation, you'll get alpha times ln m approximation. This is also very useful, because sometimes you, the ratio problem is hard to solve. So you can only approximate that within a factor alpha. Then you'll get an alpha times ln m approximation. OK, good. OK, now I think I can, I have, good, I mean, I'm good. Yeah. So I've done part two. So I just have to show you one example of this. For that, I think I'll use, I'll use generalized Steiner Forest, because I'm going to talk about it quite a bit. Okay, so I want to use this idea to design a log something approximation algorithm for a connectivity problem. Okay, your job is to tell me what I should be greedy about. Okay, that's what you should think about now. Okay, so let me state the problem and then you, let's see if you can help me design this log approximation. Okay, later in three days I'll give you a constant approximation for it. But right now I just want to exercise this technique. Okay. And I just want to make sure you can get it. Um, there are some others too. OK. So any questions before I erase this? This algebra is pretty straightforward, I think. We can just keep it. OK, what is the generalized Steiner forest problem? Probably first I should tell you about uh, Steiner tree, okay? So in the Steiner tree problem, okay, again, you're given a graph, okay? And you're given a subset of the vertices which are required. They're also called terminals, okay? And what you're required, and the graph has costs on the edges, What you're required to do is to find a min cost subgraph, right, spanning R. Okay? Even though it's called R, I'm going to call the nodes in it something like T1 to Tk, because they're terminal. OK, so let's make sure we understand this problem. What is the problem if r equals v? Minimum spanning tree. What is the problem if r equals two nodes in the graph? S and t. Shortest path between S and t. Right? I don't need a cycle, right? Because I just need to connect them up. OK? So the Steiner tree problem at the two extremes, when the size of r is two nodes or all the nodes, is polynomially solvable. But it's not otherwise. Even if you go to three, uh, you know, it gets, well, for constant, you can enumerate over the subgraphs. It's a different problem, OK? Uh, but this problem is quite popular. It was, it was uh, studied by a guy called Jakob Steiner a long time ago. He studied it on the plane. So like, for example, if I have three, the three required vertices are the uh, ends of a triangle, right? The Steiner tree on the plane will be something like that. What is a graph? The graph has all the points in the plane. It's an infinite graph. The distances are Euclidean distances. Okay? So this is an example of an optimal Steiner tree in the plane. Okay? And um, then you can generalize it to any graph, of course, in the sense we are talking about. Okay? So that's the Steiner tree problem. This problem became very popular in VLSI. You can imagine why, because all of these required vertices are pins of a chip. You have to connect them up using one net 
one connection, right? And so this is a Steiner tree, packing using Steiner trees, you know, all the routings you have to put. Okay, so that's where it comes from. The generalization of it is one where instead of terminals, you are given terminal pairs. Okay, so that is now S1, T1, S2, T2, and so on until SK, TK. Notice that these pairs need not be disjoint. You know, S1 can be TK. Okay, so this is not necessarily a disjoint pairing. And I now want to find a min cost subgraph. in which every SI is connected to its TI. Yes? Uh, Great question. Uh, so um, what is the distance function on R? Metric. So in my triangle example, right, you will find this. Whereas what I really want is that. Okay. So the optimum Steiner tree of these three nodes in the plane as the graph is this. Whereas the optimum Steiner tree only restricted to the three guys is that. Okay. So this has cost two. 2L, and this has something smaller than 2L. So that's, right, by quite a bit, right? Yeah. So that's the difference between the problem. In fact, what you're suggesting is a good approximation algorithm for Steiner tree. Okay, it's just restrict your attention only to R and find a minimum spanning tree on the metric costs that you get. Okay, so that's the two approximation. I'll probably have time to come to that, but that's not my focus right now. Okay, but I want you to understand the problem, okay? So there are pairs SITI, and I want a graph which has minimum cost, such that in that graph, every SI is connected to its TI. Notice that this graph overall may not be connected. So for example, if this is S1, okay, uh, this is S2, okay, and this is S3, T3, you know, this, I'm just, you know, this is S1, T1, they're triangle pair, okay, S2, T2, S3, T3. Right, the optimal solution may just look like that in the plane. Right? All I need is that each component contains matches of the SI's TIs. But the way in which they are grouped, you don't know. So that the problem has to figure out. Okay? And once you figure out which who's going to be connected to who, right, that set, what you're going to connect is going to be a Steiner tree on that set. But you know, here there's the added complication of figuring out which pairs go in which component, which connected component. Okay, so this is the generalized Steiner forest problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when I say spanning, that's what I mean. Sorry. Um, so when I say find a subgraph spanning R, that means the set of nodes connected in that subgraph contains R. That's what spanning means. So another way to say this is find a subgraph which is connected and contains all the nodes of R in it. Okay? And notice that both of these problems, you would not have a cycle. Because you can always delete any edge from a cycle and you'll still have connectivity. Right? That's why it's called tree and forest, respectively. Okay, you guys with me? You can implement this problem using this problem. You see that? The Steiner forest problem is a generalization of the Steiner tree problem. How? Sorry? S1 equals? Good. Make, S, make T1 to be S1, S2, S3, S4 until SK. And make T2 to be T2 t3 to be t3 and so on. So basically you're saying connect t1 to t2, connect t1 to t3, connect t1 to t4. So that means you connect everybody together. That means it's a Steiner tree. There are many other ways you can do it, but that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is a strict generalization of this problem. Okay, therefore this also generalizes shortest path and spanning tree and all of that stuff. Okay, good. Now I'm still doing greedy. Okay, what's a greedy algorithm for either of these problems? Okay. In fact, let me ask you about the Steiner Forest problem. Let's just get right to the heart of it because it's it's a harder problem. So let me just get there. Let me ask you what the greedy algorithm is. We are already getting to some interesting stuff. Okay, so you remember what the problem is, right? I have a bunch of points. For now, let me just use the plane. Okay. Okay, and these are all pairs. Okay, and I want you to find a minimum cost forest where all the corresponding pairs are connected. They are in the same connected component. How can you be greedy about this problem? Any suggestions? Yeah. Okay, good. So start with MST. And then just delete edges that are not used to connect any pair of similar edges. Okay. Okay. This is actually how basically we start doing these things, right? We start with an idea like this. Okay. And uh, either you try to show that your algorithm is a good one, right? Or more often than not, you find a bad example. Okay. So I just need to think of an example where the MST is bad in the sense the MST has some really long edges. Okay, but if I try to delete the costly part of the MST, it's actually helping some pair out. Okay, the problem is the MST does a great job of connecting everybody up. It just doesn't do a great job of connecting this pair up. Actually, the example is quite simple. Just take a cycle. Take the two guys you want to connect, have edge one plus epsilon. Every other edge here is one. So that gives you the MST. Okay? So this is the MST. Okay? This edge is not there in the MST. I can't delete anything, but there's actually a very small solution. Okay? So this algorithm does not work. Right? Because the ratio will be n divided by 1 plus epsilon. I want to get something small. Right? I've gotten it as large as I want. OK, let's try again. Another greedy algorithm. But this is basically what you have to do. You, know, you have to try some idea. But what are you being greedy about? Right? Like you have to, sorry? Good, shortest path between who? Oh, excellent. OK, so we've got an algorithm where we pick the pair SITI which has the cheapest, shortest path between them, okay? we connect that. Then what do we do? That pair is gone. We try another pair, right? Right. And then take the next shortest path and so on. Okay, you guys with me? Yeah, okay. All right. How bad is that algorithm? Can we find a bad example? Yes, yeah? Can you tell us what that is? Yeah? Yeah? Good, okay, so I think this is what you're thinking of. There are shortest paths which are all disjoint, right? But there's a really better way to connect all of them. Okay, so this path is slightly longer than this path. Okay, so these paths are all, I don't know, one. But this is one and this is epsilon, okay? So there are k guys, k pairs, each of them is taking its own path of length one. But if only they cooperated a little bit, they would all have gotten it for one plus a little bit. Okay, so again, our ratio becomes factor k. Good, but this is a really good, good greedy algorithm. In fact, excellent, okay, that's, I was hoping you lost that, I'm glad you did. So after I connected the first pair, 
if I say this path now after I took it cos 0, then this pair would be very easily able to find a path of length 4 epsilon between each other. So after I pick a shortest path, if I reset the weights on that path to be 0, I contract them. Right? And then I run the greedy algorithm, this could be a good greedy algorithm. Right? Excellent. Can we analyze it? OK. This is a question. I know I'm coming up to lunch, but this might be your homework, actually. <laughs> but basically, so you see where I'm going, right? You have a greedy algorithm in mind, which is pick the pair SITI, which are closest to each other, build the path, contract it. So the whole graph now has changed. People who are far away from each other have now become close. Find the next pair that are closest to each other, contract it, and continue until all the pairs are gone. Okay? I don't know of a small and simple analysis of this algorithm. Okay? In fact, it is an interesting problem for people in the field if you are able to show that this algorithm comes with a performance ratio of 2, let's say. It would actually simplify lots of other analysis. Right, but I paid for it. Yeah. No, yeah. Right. But in which case, you will be optimal. You will be doing the right thing anyway. So that case is not a problem case for your algorithm. So uh, the question was, if all the paths in optimum itself are disjoint, then this heuristic will do beautifully. Because it will just find the cheapest one first, contract it, finish that part off, then go to the next one. So the problem case is when there is a slightly costlier tree that seems to do the job, but your shortest path lead you astray. But now, if I, when I, whenever I pick a pair and I contract the path between them, and I continue, right? Can I show this algorithm is a constant factor approximation algorithm? Is greedy constant factor for Steiner Forest? The answer is not known. Okay? But I want you to think of an even more greedy algorithm. Okay? So, this is, so let me write something down because I've been speaking a lot. So greedy says pick pair SITI with shortest path and contract. Okay? That's greedy. Okay? And you do this you know, until everybody is taken care of, right? There is a very greedy algorithm, which in the interest of lunch, I'm going to call gluttonous. Okay? How can you be even more greedy than greedy itself? Connect the closest, connect the closest pair. I actually don't care. Like in this algorithm, I wouldn't want to connect S1 with T1. Connect S1 to anybody else who hasn't found their mate. Because everybody is sort of in the same boat. We are all trying to find some connection. Just call all these guys to be active. Why are they active? Because they haven't found their terminal pair yet. The very greedy algorithm says, connect a pair of closest active nodes. OK? And then contract them and continue. What is the guarantee that you will end with a solution that is feasible? Yeah, you suggested the algorithm. What is the guarantee? So we continue to do that until they're active. So, that's the answer for you, right? So, as long as somebody is active, somebody hasn't found their mate, they are part of an active component. So this algorithm will continue, and it will stop only when everybody is inactive. That means nobody, everybody has found their mate. That means you've got a feasible solution. Okay? So the very greedy or gluttonous algorithm is pick any active pair that are closest to each other, I just call it closest active pair, and merge. Okay, when I say merge, I mean take the shortest path and contract it. Okay, so let's, I, I want to make sure that all of you are with me because at this point you might get lost. Okay, so let's see. So here is my. Let's actually do it on that example. 
Hier. Ja. Yes. Should, should you choose one of those? Okay. Okay, I don't. That's right. Right? Another active node? Yeah. Okay, and that's actually what this algorithm is. Okay, so first let's figure out what active is. What is active? Active set. Okay, S is a set such that S intersect S I T I is just one. Okay, just one of the S I T I it doesn't have the other, right? You are active if you haven't found your mate, right? So for some i. So to begin with, right? My my graph is empty. I've got nothing in my graph, okay? And all the active components are. Singletons, the singletons which are S1, T1, S2, T2, and so on. Okay? Then I find the closest active pair and I merge them. When I merge them, I build the path between them and I call that whole thing one connected component. That connected component, if you're lucky, it may not be active anymore. You might have picked S1 and T1, right? Yeah. I think the question might have been yeah. connect one active and connect to anybody. Active or not. But active or not, you're not making any progress then we can't answer his question. If I connect S1 to somebody, like is that somebody going to eventually help me get to my mate? Right, so for example, you know, I can have S1 and a decoy of short paths leading to nowhere, whereas S2 is here, T1 is here. So, you know, this is really wasteful. So if you just want to connect to anybody, you may just like, it's like going on a wild goose chase, you're not coming back. Whereas that algorithm, right, you know that you're connecting with somebody, maybe S3, but together you know you're still active and you're going to try and find somebody else who is active. Okay, so here is a question then for you to finish off this analysis. Okay, if I want to get a log something approximation algorithm for this problem, I need to show the ratio greedy lemma. What is the ratio greedy lemma? that the cost of what I picked divided by the amount by which I covered is less than or equal to cost of opt divided by what opt covers. What is opt covering in this case? The number of pairs connected. So opt is making everybody inactive if you throw opt, right? Whereas when you throw your path in, you may or may not make somebody inactive, but you know in the very end, you're going to make everybody inactive. So you want to show that the rate at which you are reducing the number of active components, right? that's the correspondence to set cover, is as good as the rate at which opt is doing it. If you're able to do that, you've got yourself a log n approximation. Right? So that's what I want you to prove for homework. Okay, so that's a gluttonous algorithm. By the way, I don't know what Greedy's performance is. Okay, I still don't know what Greedy's performance is. It'll be good to figure it out, yeah. Uh, just to be yeah. clear on the gluttonous algorithm, I pick a pair, the closest pair of the active vertices. That's right. Yeah, not the active components. I'm sorry, I meant components. Because after I pick a pair of active vertices, together they become one contracted vertex when I merge them. So, ah, so in fact, yeah, contractions. yeah, contractions. I do contra I mean, I'm going to do this yes. contractions. Right? I'm going to help myself. Yeah, okay. But this is an algorithm where you are going towards progress, right, in a predictable way. So I want you to prove cost of path i. Right. I want you to relate it somehow to cost of opt divided by number of active components. Remain. Right? So if I'm able to prove this somehow, then I can plug this into the other analysis and I can get a log m approximation. So what is 
Path i is the path that I picked at iteration i. I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear, but you know, at each iteration i, you pick the two closest active components and you merge the path between them. So that has a certain cost, okay? And so I want, I want you to somehow argue that the cost of that path can be related to some progress you're making. Okay, so this is quite, uh, it's not that easy. It's not that easy, but I want you to think about how you might prove something like that, okay? Um, yeah? Here? If the number of active components remaining is zero, you don't have anything more to run. You're finished. Your algorithm is over. At i, at i, remaining at time i. Yeah. So you know you still have work to do. You build a path. That means you've done some work. You want to charge it against something in opt. So this is the charging lemma. Okay. Okay. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, Good, and uh, I think, let me state another problem, okay? Because if, if you're come somewhat stymied by this, I think this is a bit tough, okay? So I'll state one other problem which might be easier for you to do, okay? Which is also the same idea, but I just want you to exercise it. Sorry for going a minute or two over. Not sure, uh, should I do it or not? Yeah. Ask a question, yeah. Uh, do we need the metric uh, for this problem? Uh, Another great question. Uh, do we need a metric for this problem or not? Okay, so first question is this. Second question is related. So do, do you see what he's asking? He's asking, should I assume that the distances between the pairs of nodes obey the triangle inequality for this problem? Okay. I claim no. I claim you don't need triangle inequality, but you have to tell me why. Okay, so I, I claim I can run this algorithm because remember what I'm picking, I'm picking shortest paths. So even though the direct connection from me to you may not, may be very costly, if I find a shortest path, I can add it. It's not hurting me in this problem anyway. So I can assume metric without loss of generality. Okay, if you didn't understand that, you have to think about it, okay? But the third pro the, the, the other problem I want you to think about is uh, facility location. Can I go for another five minutes? What do you say, Satya? Okay, so let me just tell you that problem. It's, this is the right place for you to think about it. Just like set cover, okay? Remember set cover, there were sets and elements. Okay, now you have facilities and clients. Okay, now in every, remember in set cover you had a cost for each set. Now I have a cost for opening a facility, F. Okay, and there is a distance function. This, all of these guys are sitting in some graph. Okay, so some graph here. Okay, so there are distant lengths on these edges. You know, this is I and J, this will have length IJ. Okay, the facility location problem with no capacities, U is uncapacitated, says find a minimum cost set of facilities to open. So you're going to open, say, this facility and that facility, and assign all the clients to their closest facility according to this length function. So think of it in a, you know, in a, in a plane. I'm a company and I have these four warehouses. Okay, and here are all my clients. I need to figure out which warehouses to open, right? So maybe I open this one, and I open that one. They cost money to open, and I have to assign everybody to come to their closest warehouse. Okay, and coming to the warehouse also costs money, cost distance. Okay, so I'm minimizing cost of the facilities I'm opening, plus the sum of the distances that every client has to travel to get there. Okay, and I want to do this at minimum total cost. Okay, what is the greedy algorithm for this problem? Set cover. Show me that it's a log approximation. Okay, it's very similar, right? You see how close these problems are, right? Sets and elements. Exactly, so you have to tell me what the set cover algorithm is 
that takes into account the cost of opening the facility and the distances. Set cover didn't have distances. It just said when you open the facility, you got everybody. Now you have to change the greedy algorithm a little bit. Tell me how you'll change the greedy algorithm of set cover to get me a log approximation for UFL. Okay, that's problem three. Actually, that two is not really a problem. You should forget it. Yeah. Problem two. Okay, so you've got two tasks. Okay, first is you have a question? Yeah. Costs of who? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so, but you're, so if, I, if the cost is, say, two, I make two copies, is it? No. You say it again? Sorry. Right. Okay. Cost what? Okay. Apply what? Set cover. But set cover doesn't have distances at all. See, right? Set the, the problem that's missing, the thing that's missing from facility location, from set cover for facility location is, in set cover, if you pick the set, you got everybody here. But now if you pick this set, to get this guy, you have to go this distance. To get this guy, you have to go, think of this, right? If I pick this facility, to get this guy, I have to go this distance. If I pick this facility, it's a different distance. That was not there in set cover. So now you have to tell me how to add these distances into the ratio step. Right? So I still need to figure out what's the rate at which I'm covering, but I need to cover at the best rate. And I, I need to figure out that somehow relates to opt and show a log approximation. Okay, so UFL, and if we have time, we'll do this. Today afternoon, okay? 12, 2.30, yeah. Okay, see you then. Yeah.